For this review, I'm going to go over another game here. It is the, it's called The Shadow World, a sci-fi storytelling card game. Okay, so picked this up at a gaming store. There, I saw the box, I looked through it, and it just um, instantly appealed to me, and I just held off for a few weeks, and I finally bought it, just to see what it's like. Uh, it's very simple, anyone can play, there's not much rules to it, just different ways to play all the same concept, is that you try to tell a story with cards drawn. This is um, from Lawrence King Publishing, and it's part of their Magical Mariorama's Miri game. So, okay, so what's a Mariorama? Well, it's something that developed in the Victorian times, where it's a series of pictures or cards that you put side by side and they form a continuous image and the neat thing about it is you take these cards separate them, rearrange them put it side by side and you have another continuous image just in a different order this takes that and turns it into a little storytelling game and looking at this this could be an interesting party game or you can have your kids play with it and just see what kind of ideas about it and well let's take a look and see how you know what it consists of so okay, so everything you need to play this game is all in this nice little box, and um, take a look at back here, it you know, doesn't tell anybody complex, just shows an example of how the cards are put together. They're drawn um, to where they can all be rearranged seamlessly side to side. And let's see, it advertises this many uh, storytelling possibilities. There's only 20 cards in this, so this has to come probably from the imagination. Yeah, well, maybe mathematically you could figure that out. There's just 20 different cards here, but um, almost like resting. So you open up the box, it's magnetically sealed. And uh, let's see, enter the shadow world. What happens when time is bent, space is collapsed, and dimensions overlap? Descend into the shadow world to find out. Um, you might encounter a one-eyed member of the retrofuturistic cult, or a maverick aeronaut, or exiled scientist, both determined to change the world and ours, or an astronaut, the hapless victim of time travel mishap, or the people wanting to catch up um, with all of them. With many games to play and millions of stories to tell, each turn a card as a you know is in a new adventure. Where you know, sorry, each turn of the card is a new adventure. Where will the story take you? When you open this up, okay, all the cards are here. Now this one right, this little fold out right here, you know, this one comes loose, you know, and it tells not only example of play here and how the cards are arranged, it also tells the name of each cards. Um, yes, it's kind of like tarot, but you don't play it as much. You just put it side by side and you tell a story, whatever comes to your mind of what the events are happening here. And it just shows how they're beautifully arranged at certain points. Now when you open it up, you're, you know, and the cards themselves will be wrapped in cellophane. I already took mine out, of course. It comes with all the cards. Um, Umbra Mundi, that is Shadow World in Latin, just FYI. So you get this fold out, which is the same thing as before, but in the back are the ways you can play this. Let's see. Fire imagination with these fun storytelling cards, reviving the 19th century craze of Mary Ramas or many pictures. 20 exquisitely illustrated cards can be placed in any order to create a seamless scene stretching up to 170 centimeters, five and a half feet long. Almost infinite combination of cards provide endless storytelling opportunities. And let's see, London, 1900, a brilliant scientist leaves the world above to create his own world below, determined to prove his radical theory, that gravity is a geometric property of space-time. What happens when time is bent, space is collapsed, and dimensions overlap? Descend into the shadow world to find out. And, you know, with four games to play and millions of stories to tell, each turn of the card is a new adventure. I'm going to turn back to this, and let's explore the cards. Now, the cards themselves are a nice little, um, Thick, you know, not the flimsy kind you play poker with. And, you know, each has a picture. It's a bit surreal, this game is, because, you know, you see buildings, fish, uh, other sea life flying, or flying around. You'll see, you know, skeletons, or, you know, like this one is a skeleton holding the hand of a child. Man crossing, you know, crossing this, uh, what looks like a underground sewer with a torch. You know, there's an astronaut. You know, a couple of uh, cyclops and you know, cyclopses in inside of a um, jars. More fish going around. You see a person down here, but there's also a person down here. All these are elements that you use to see if you can tell whatever comes to your mind when you put it together. So just wonderful, you know, beautiful art. Um, this is actually done by an artist from Hong Kong. Um, there's an on the website there they interviewed the artist there. Um, let's see, what was his name? Uh, Shan Jiang. Um, yeah, Shan Jiang. You know, he did all this. 
this kind of wonderful clash of various genres. Let's see, uh, ocean life traveling around pipes. And, you know, it's kind of the concept of you take how some beginning artists will take a small, take a paper with a small doodle that has no main shape, and you take that and try and complete a picture with it. Same concept here. You know, you take these, you know, cards and how you turn them over, and there's a number of ways to do this, and you try to create a story with it. And that's where the replay value is. The replay value is in your imagination. So I love this werewolf one. Of course, I love werewolves, you know, as many of you may know. Um, so, yes, a remote control, a guy remote controlling a giant robot, guy in the background. I don't know about you, but I think Pink Floyd, or, you know, when I see this. What do you think? All right, so he has a ship, a couple people around it. And, you know, guy in the background, you know, cat, guy in an Anubis mask. So that's the cards. There's 20 cards, and the idea is you put these cards together and um, try to create a story as they come about. So I'll put these back here, and we'll go over the rules, various types of play. All right, so here we go. Game rules. Um, let's see. The Sinister Story Relay. This can involve any number of players. Shuffle the cards, then place them face down in a row next to each other. Each player takes a turn, you know, takes it in turn to turn over a card, continuing the story thread of the previous player, using the elements of the card. The last person to turn the card must attempt to wrap up the story satisfactorily. All right. Now there's another way: a myriad mysteries. Um, two to five players. Deal four or five cards face down to each you know, player. Each person takes it in turn to build a story from their own cards, using them in whichever order they wish. Players may vote in their favor when everyone has, you know, where everyone has been. Then we got first and the last, two to five players. Deal two cards face up to each, to, pl you know, to each player, specifying that the first is the beginning and the second is the ending card. Each player must immediately place the cards in front of them with a space in between. Deal two or three further cards um, to each person. Each player takes it in turn to uh, to build a story that begins and ends with the initial cards. This was probably the um, more challenging one. Dire consequences. Two to four players. Let's see. Shuffle it and deal an equal number of cards face down to each player. Each person takes it in turn to put down a card put down a card next to that of the previous player and build a story. But this time, some of the cards have special consequences. And so these are the names of the cards, and you can find out what it was through the foldouts that name each of the cards. So if you draw the witch, you know, strike a killer spell and sentence any player to an untimely death. They must immediately drop out of the game. If you draw the girl, play this card game at any time. Even if it is not your turn to go, to quash the current story thread and take it to wherever direction you wish. The Cyclops. Put a curse on the next player and make them cover one eye every time someone turns over a card for the rest of the game. Wife bot, a talisman against evil. Keep hold of this card in case an opponent tries to use another consequence card against you. The wife bot renders the card powerless. Mask man, play this card to make the rest of the players do your bidding for the remainder of the game. You might make them talk. Uh, you might make them talk backwards before taking your turn, or balance books on their head for the rest of the game kind of nonsensical but eh, if you're into that it's kind of fun and I'm sure with this um, you could you know make up your own rules on how um, you can um, form a story through certain limitations like this one idea I have is like you roll a die you could roll a 20 sided dice um, for one person that's how many cards they draw and draw a story with that that's an idea so that's a shadow world so I'm going to make a bad attempt and see what's, you know, show a sample play of this. Let's give that a shot. Okay, so what you do, you kind of shuffle this, these cards up here a bit. And, you know, however you can, as often as you can. I don't know if you can find card sleeves this size to protect the, um, the artwork on it. But, you could look around. So, I'm going to go with my idea here and roll this 20-sided die. And whatever number I roll, that's what... Uh, that's what I'll draw and try to see if I can tell a story. Alright, let's see what number I roll here. Eight. Okay, we're going to draw eight and see what story we can tell. Okay, so let's start with the first one. 
All right, so we see uh, these two right here. Okay, let's see what I get um, out of this. All right, so here we have the Bastet, the Egyptian goddess, and her disciple, you know, right below her. As she's gazing across the field there, you know, seeing all the life swimming around her, you know, most mortals cannot um, interact with all the sea life going around here, um, but she could. But she's gazed upon there as if she's staring out to the stars, and she asked her disciple, Could you bring me something that belongs to one of us? I sense something is near. Could you go search for it? What is it, he, you know, he, the disciple asks. You'll know it when you see it. So, let's put this one right here. Let me draw the next card. Ah, so here I have this one right here. Upon his journey, he finds three people gazing over some old junk, you know, that they, you know, debating whether they could scrap or not. He asks if they've seen anything unusual, you know, something that belongs to the gods. They say no. But the guy upstairs might, you know, you know, might know something capturing the lights that's floating around. He asked him, he points him in the right direction, as you might see something further along that direction, you know, this way. So, so put this aside. That's two. The next one here, ah. He comes across a wolf, uh, one of Anubis's children. You know, Anubis is usually jackals and wild dogs, but also spread to wolves from time to time. The wolf, recognizing him as, uh, as a disciple of Bastet, does not attack him. And he carefully, through self-will, um, asks what he wants. He says, I'm looking for something of the gods for Bastet. And the werewolf points in and says, you want to go this way. You know, something, you know, a giant arm is holding it. Hmm. All right. So we put that aside. To the next one. Ah. So in the scene there, uh, you know, across his journey to try and find his object for Bastet, he finds a skeleton holding the hands of a young child. He, you know, he asks, you know, if they know anything about um, something from the gods for Bastet. The child, you know, she does not claim to know anything about such things. He's just helping a skeleton here, you know, for, you know, try and find his way through the underworld. So having no help there, he continues on. Ah, uh, one of the landmarks of the uh, of the shadow world. Uh, underneath this one, one of the triangles that reminds me of the pyramids of ancient Egypt, he gazes upon a moon. A moon is odd, but, you know, because no matter what light you shine on, it reflects nothing. So it's like a total eclipse. Beneath, you know, beneath it, wandering around, is a zebra eating. How it gets food, he doesn't know, but it it seems you know odd out and out of place. But so are many things here in the shadow world. He continues on. Uh, but then he notices something. Ignoring a man chasing a robot and claiming that he's stolen his lunch, he comes across you know you know the man here right before the guard, you know right before you know the arm, you know which he's been told holds something of him. Says, "Is this you know?" Um, is that anything important from the gods? And the man says, well, yes, that's the Eye of Ra, or Horus. He wasn't quite sure, but it is one of the gods. He tells him that he's a disciple of Bastet, which, you know, he recognizes from his outfit. And, you know, he says that Bastet says, retrieve it, you know, you know, for her. And the man says, I've been waiting for you, and allows him to take the item there to be, you know, to be on his way back to Bastet. So he takes it. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, two more. Ah. Along the way, he said, you know, he finds a disciple of Anubis, and you know, he has a small chat with him, and Anubis recognizes, the, you know, the disciple of Bastet, and also notices the eye of Ra. You know, and his hand says, ah, I see, you know, Bastet has been waiting for that. But don't even worry for me. It's not such things are not important right now. Have you seen one of my children here? I kind of needed to help against this rat here has been, you know, chewing on the power cables. He told us that he met one earlier and he guided him along his way and he pointed the right direction. He says, "Thank you. Um, you know, please go along." All right. Let's see. We're at that's seven. We got one more. Ah, there we go. 
and there he comes across you know two tanks there he avoids this one because he figures that you know it, no good could come out of that especially with such an important object to carry back to Bastet he meets a small you know child there or, you know or at least he thinks it's a small child holding a lantern there and um, he you know tries to question it and he recognizes there's certain presence about this and finds out that this is also Bastet in one of her other forms outside a cat you know, you know, he gives the eye of raw to her and she thanks him for it. What she needs of it, he has no idea. He only does what he is told. But his quest is at an end and she'll reward him in time. And there you go. That's a simple story from start to finish. I told you it wasn't much, but as you can see, I'm going to pick this up. It starts from, you know, starts from the beginning. And as you build a story, it all connects. You know. Such, and you could probably come up with much more creative ideas than I do. Just a minute, there we go. But these are wonderfully drawn, and this, you know, and hopefully, this may inspire you and to pick this up and give it a shot. This could be again. This could be good for um, for young kids to practice their creativity. It's a good party game. You know, or you could just maybe some writing idea exercises. But that is the shadow world. Go ahead and you know it'll be a nice little conveniently magnetically closed box. Thank you all for watching and you have a nice day.